name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christ is in our midst. Good morning, beloved brothers and sisters. Even before Christ came, before the light of truth shone in the world, there were men among the Gentiles, I don't mean among the enlightened Jews, to whom the prophets had been given, but I mean even among the Gentiles, the pagans, there were those who sought virtue and tried to find it. Amidst the darkness of this world, they tried to be virtuous. They tried to find this. A famous Roman politician and orator Cicero, he says, the man who has virtue is in need of nothing whatever for the purpose of living well. You have virtue, you have all you need, according to Cicero. Today we live in a world that has lost even natural virtue. See, the pagans, through reason, tried to find natural virtue. They didn't have the illumination of God. They didn't understand grace. They didn't understand these deeper things. So they looked at the world and they said, how should it work? How should it function? And so there comes to be a kind of natural morality. And in the world we live in today, even natural morality is waning. It's gone. In the old times, in the Middle Ages, they would teach children the morality of the philosophers. But then they would correct it with the morality of Christ. They would raise it to a higher level. For the pagans, there's four great virtues. Wisdom, justice, courage, and moderation or temperance, depending on how you want to name it. I will preach on these four virtues. I'll preach on wisdom, the greatest one last, because as you'll see, it, it affects all the others. So today I'll preach about justice and talk about justice. The pagans actually had a well-defined concept of what justice would be. They said, do no harm. They said, if you have public, if there's public property, treat it as public, respect it. What's private is yours, is what they would say. They actually said that men exist for the sake of other men, is what they said. This is interesting. They said men don't exist for themselves, they exist for others. That each man may benefit another. That's actually what they said. Did they care about honesty? Yes. Like Saint Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, who compiled the Philokalia. He was so horrified at how dishonest the Greeks of his time were, we're talking about the 1700s, that he wrote to them, he said, you are so dishonest. And yet, he said, the great ruler of Athens, Pericles, during Athens' golden age, was honest to a fault. They said that he would stake his life on honesty. There was even some quote from St. Nicodemus, I don't remember what it was, I, I, I looked for it, but I couldn't find it for you. But it was something like, Pericles was so intense about his honesty, he said, I will put my life on the line for my word. My word is my life. You can take my life if you don't think my word is true. And he led Athens to a golden era. And St. Nicodemus says, you who claim to follow Christ, and yet you lie. And this man who knew nothing but the idols, he spoke the truth intensely. The pagans cared about obligations. So men would have obligations to their families, to society, to their country, to their state, to others. And they had to fulfill these obligations. This was very critical for them. And so that's why we have St. Paul in 1 Timothy 5.8 who says, speaking to Timothy, his son, he says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Why does he say that? Because even the heathens would have provided. Because the heathens saw this as a tremendous sacred obligation. They would provide. Okay. And so for the pagans, everything was about these obligations. And today, many people don't even take regard their obligations in a deep sense. They don't regard them heavily. On, on, I, I would say laziness. The pagans would have condemned laziness massively. Because they would have said, if you have obligations, but you're lazy, you're unjust. You're unjust to those to whom you owe your obligations. And so even they would have condemned laziness. They would have said, we must, we must render to all what we owe them. This is the very, very basic pagan concept of life. If you owe something, you render it. You render it to the fullest extent. St. Baisius talks about natural morality too. He talks about this. He says that if two men are invited to a cell on Mount Athos to an elder, the elder will set before them cups of cold water and will set before them Turkish delight because this is what Athenites like to give to people. And let's say there's ten pieces of Turkish delight and the elder sets it before both. If the men are human, they'll split them evenly, five and five. St. Baisius says this is not Christian at all. It's just human. If one man takes more and leaves his brother with less, this is demonic. So it's not Christian to share equally. See, for the pagans, it's equity. Everything is equity. And so we as Christians should think carefully, do we live even to the degree of the pagans? Because the pagans demanded equity. They demanded that you render perfectly what you should render. Again, many pagans didn't do this, but this was the standard by which even the pagans held themselves. 
You should render what you owe. You should render truth. You should render honesty. You should be diligent. And you should render these things. So if we were to take St. Paisius, he would say there is no virtue in equity at all. None. If a man shares equally, he has done the human thing. And this is fine. It's not sinful. But it's nothing, there's nothing Christian about it. There's nothing virtuous at all about it. St. Paisius would say that the Christian would give more to his brother. Why? Because he wants his brother to leave more satisfied than he. See, the one virtue you don't see among these four cardinal virtues, which are valid virtues. We don't deny the four virtues of pagan say. But we would say that they need to be completed. They need to be raised. You don't see love there. You don't see love. Right? Of these four great virtues, love is not one of them. It's not there. It isn't. Christian justice flows from love. So St. Pius would say Christian justice is to give more to your brother because his satisfaction is your satisfaction. The Christian would say, I'm satisfied because my brother is full. I may not be full, but my brother is, and this satisfies me because this is love. See, we have this view that if we tell the truth, we are good. We're good men, not good Christians. To tell the truth is what men should do to men. When we meet a man, we expect him to tell us the truth. That's good. To tell the truth is fine. Muslims tell the truth. But Christians should be far more than this. For the Christian, honesty is that his entire life should express Christ completely, fully. So for us to be honest, it must be much more than simply words. It must be more than simply contractual. St. Ambrose says, the pagans, and St. Ambrose was brought up as a Stoic, he was brought up as a philosopher. St. Ambrose says that the Stoics say, treat the public goods with respect, but your own is your own. St. Ambrose says, no. What God has given to everyone, he's given to everyone. As in, my goods also must be given away. My goods must also belong to the poor. I must also have mercy and share according to my ability. Right, so the pagans would say, what is mine is mine, and no man can lay his hands upon it. But St. Ambrose says, but love commands us to share. Love commands us to give more. Hence, we have Paul entering today with this beautiful book of Philemon, his shortest work. And all this work is, is Paul's writing to this blessed man named Philemon, this apostle, this leader of the church in Colossa. And he's basically saying to him, that slave that ran away from you, Onesimus, he's come to me. And he's with me. And I've converted him. In fact, St. Paul even calls Onesimus my part. He's my child. No. He's repented. And he says, Onesimus has sinned against you. In fact, if we listen to the text carefully, there's implications that Onesimus not only ran away, which is obvious, but he might also have robbed Philemon. He might have ripped him off as he left. And St. Paul says, whatever debts he has, I'll pay him. But if you read the letter more closely, there's a lot of powerful things in here, and this contrasts the pagan life of the Christian one. Because Onesimus had violated every condition that he was under. He had violated every single code of conduct that he would have within that society, how it should operate. He broke away from his master and he robbed him. What does Paul say to him? Well, first of all, Paul begins by saying, I could exercise Christian justice, the justice of the church. I said Christian justice is love. There's also the justice of the church. That's when a bishop or an apostle even, or a priest gives a command and people are obliged to follow. So Paul says, I could make bold to make you do what I want with the power of Christ. With my authority, I can make you do this. I could force you to. But, he says, I don't desire this. I desire that your goodness would come from your own heart. He says later in the epistle, he says, I don't want this act of yours to be from compulsion. I want it to be yours. So St. Paul, soaring on the wings of grace, is so high that he won't even appeal to his authority to make Philemon do anything. He says, I'm your father. I gave birth to you in Christ, and I'm asking you to receive Onesimus back, not as a slave, but as a brother. That's intense. And St. Paul even says, if he has robbed you, if he is in debt to you, I will pay it. Put it on my account for his sake. So Paul is saying, whatever the obligations were, they're much lower than love. They're much lower than, than what Christ is asking from us. And I'm asking you, without the obligations of the church, which you would owe me anyway, to receive this man back and forgive him, and to love him, and to receive him back as more than a slave, but now as a brother. It's a profound epistle. It's very short, very short. And yet within it, it's encaps it, encapsula it encapsulates this reality of love. And see, St. Paisios is right when he says that justice for the Christian is not merely rendering equality, it's rendering more. Because real love is based on sacrifice. So for the Christian, justice always flows from sacrifice. The justice of the church is sacrifice. The church gives herself up for the people. Christ gives himself up for the people. And so, beloved, we should examine ourselves carefully to see, do we meet the level of Christ? If not, do we meet the level of man? 
If not, then we live like the demons. But even then we should not despair because we should say God can raise up even the demonic man from where he is. And we should be hard on ourselves, and I'll explain to you what I mean. When I say hard on ourselves, we shouldn't be filled with gnawing fear. But Christ is love. Christ is merciful. Christ has forgiven us many times. Those of us who have been in the church for years, he's forgiven for many, many, many years. And so what I would say to you is that it should be our greatest joy to labor to become good. It should be a great joy for us. It should be a great positive work for us to be hard on ourselves to say, my greatest desire is to please Christ. There's nothing higher. There's nothing higher than to meet him. There's nothing higher than to please him. And the last thing I would want would be to stand in his presence and for him to look down and not gaze upon me. But I'd rather please him and receive his mercy. So we should be hard on ourselves, not with anxiety, but with joy, with love, with a desire to strip away what isn't of God and to replace with what is. And if we are living demonically, we should live like men. And once we live like men, we should say, Lord, take me higher so I can live like a Christian. People should not be satisfied with the morality of the world. The morality of the world is not Christian at all. Never be satisfied with the way worldly people think. And if we live in the world, then we will begin to think too much like the world. And that's what happens. That's our temptation. We are at workplaces. People live a certain way. And we think this is how the world is. Do not think that because you're honest, you're a good Christian. That's just being a good man. Just because you're fair does not make you a Christian. It makes you a good man. But a Christian is called to become a God by grace. And we should ascend higher and higher with joy. Because that's where Christ wants to take us. Don't be despondent. There's nothing to be despondent about. God is, will lift us up. That's what he's been doing this entire time. And he will continue to do this for as long as we live. Amen. Amen.